So, serving to win others. We're going to start, if you have your Bible with you, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at 19 through 27. Verses 19 through 27. We're going to read through it for just a second. For I am free from all men. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without the law. Not being without the law towards God but under the law towards Christ. That I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one, who, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for that prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run this not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I, my sh I myself should become disqualified. What we read here, starting in verse 19, is Paul's mission. How many of you have heard the phrase mission statement? Okay, a mission statement. What does a mission statement do? Well, many organizations, teams, businesses, they have a mission statement. The goal of a mission statement is to guide a business or organization's decisions, direction, and philosophy. The idea is every decision that they make, every time something comes up, they should be able to look at their mission statement and say, does this support the mission of our organization? Does this determine the direction that we want to go? Is what we are doing in accordance with the direction that we have determined we want to go? Similar to the way that the church should look at every decision that they make and look at the scriptures and say, is this in accordance with what the scriptures tell us to do. Now, Paul's mission statement in verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. Does that sound like a mission statement? I am making myself a servant that I may win. What does it say behind that? To the Jews, he became a Jew. Does that mean he changed what he believes? Is that what it meant? No. To those who are under the law, is under the law. And then it says that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as the law, to, okay. as without the law. So those who are without the law, the Gentiles... He associated with the Gentiles. And to those who are weak, he related to those who are weak. Is this the first time that we have read in the scriptures about some sort of a mission statement? Is this the first time someone said, I come to serve? Go ahead. Their plans, correct? Matthew 28, 19, what are we told? Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Go, you know, do this. You're given a mission. What about Luke 19, verse 10? Flip over there in your, in your Bibles if you've got a second. And I'll, I'll tell you... Um, It, teaching a Bible class for me, if we have conversation, we have discussion, 
that makes it go a lot. I'm not nearly as experienced as some of the other members here. Uh, having any conversation or feedback, I really appreciate that. So if you have something to add or a comment or a question, feel free to raise your hand. 19 verse 10. What's, I'm sorry. Not, yes, 19 verse 10. But it starts really in about verse 8. So Zacchaeus has stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, or, well, let's back up from there. In verse 6, the Gentiles, Zacchae, or Jesus was going to Zacchaeus' house. And in verse 7, but when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. So people were complaining that Jesus was associating with Zacchaeus. And you read on down through it in verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Sounds like a mission statement right there, right? He came to seek and save that which was lost. If we look back at Paul and we think about this mindset... What were the reasons for his mission? Why was he so zealous in accomplishing his mission? What, what, is, what goes into his background that leads to him being... Okay, so the destruction of the Jews or the destruction of the Christians? If you think about the time when he was... Exactly. I think Paul could have been motivated by his guilt. Why did Paul persecute the church? That's exactly right. Do we think Paul, if Paul had known that he was doing something wrong, do we think that he would have continued to do it? How many people do we know today that are worshiping in error because of ignorance, because they don't know the truth. It's something to think about. I think Paul was in error out of ignorance. He legitimately did not know and did not believe that Christ was the true Messiah, the true Son of God. Paul, Paul never did anything halfway. That's exactly right. Um, what Doug was saying for the, the rest of the audience, that Paul was very devoted to his beliefs and that that's why God and Jesus chose him because of his devotion, because of his, his, his level of, of devotion to his actions. Paul could have never lost, or he could have... It's hard to say that Paul ever forgot his lost state. Does that make sense? So Paul said he was the what of sinners? Chief of sinners. Does that mean that he thought his sins were more egregious than others? Or does that mean that he was a leader of other sinners? Maybe both, right? We don't really know. You know, that's kind of subject to interpretation. But he makes a point to say this, say that. So in some level, you have to think it played into his psyche. It, it played into his motivation. What is our motivation to serve others? Heaven, okay? For us and them. How many times is our motivation guilt or remembering that we were in a lost state? I don't know that that's necessarily something that, that, would that, that we think about as a motivating factor for us. 
when I, I think about motivating factors, to me, you never mentioned him to me, the song. When in the better land, before the bar we stand, how deeply grieved my soul will, it will be. If any lost one there should cry in deep despair, you never mentioned him to me. That is a motivating factor to me. Amen. That's right. And, and Paul actually mentions that in 1 Corinthians when he talks about in, in verse 9, when he talks in, or excuse me, chapter 9 in verse 25, and everyone who competes for the, prize, for the prize is temperate in all things. Is temperate, that word is patient. Is patient in all things. Yes. That's exactly right. And that we're going to get to that. So part of serving is being adaptable and being patient and, and having that, having the mindset of I'm going to learn how somebody else learns. I'm going to think about how somebody else learns and I'm going to go to them and I'm going to meet them on their terms. Now, let's look at, look at, let's look at something else regarding Paul's motivation. In Romans chapter 6, Verses 17 through 20. Let's read these scriptures. Romans chapter 6, 17 through 20. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine of which you were delivered. And having been set free of sin... You became slaves of righteousness, that I may speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, lawlessness learning to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness." Verse 21, let's read that. What fruit did you have then in such things of which you are now ashamed? If we look at this scripture, one of the things that we take out of it is that Paul understood that the men who were lost were joyfully lost. Does that make sense? If, you know the saying, you don't know what you don't know? So many people out there are very happy living in sin. They don't know any difference between being obedient and being sinful. They think that they're okay. But he says, now, now that you know that you're lost and that you're saved, you have been set free from your sin. You have become slaves to righteousness. Now, so now... You want to do what is right. That the righteousness, the scriptures, are determining your actions. It's like, kind of like you, they didn't have a choice at that point but to be obedient now that they knew what obedience really meant. Another thing that I think that it was in, that's interesting there that Paul says, and it goes to Doug's point about being adaptable, where it says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh? What does that mean? Maybe he spoke in terms that they could understand. 
I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Maybe they're not mature enough at this point to really understand complicated language. So he's saying, I'm going to break this down as simple as I can for you. Do we need to do that sometimes when we're having these conversations? An important thought to remember when we're teaching, when we're serving, because the goal of this lesson is is what we're talking about, serving to win others. So many times we... Let me back up. I feel like sometimes we have a reputation of just wanting to win the argument more so than actually serving others and teaching others. When we're having a Bible study with someone, we obviously want them to believe the Scriptures. But is our goal, should our goal be for them to see and understand the Scriptures, or are we just trying to win an argument? Are we going to get anywhere if we're just trying to win the argument, just to one up, play one-upmanship on the next person? So there has to be a degree of humility in this, correct? Paul was able to achieve his mission. Why was he able to achieve his mission? Well, since we're in Romans chapter 9, let's look at verse 13. So this is the first time, I let me digress. This is the first time I've been in front of a crowd using this Bible, and I really like it because it's big enough for me, the print's big enough to read, and it's small enough for me to carry with me. Here's the thing. The verse notation, I didn't realize that they made font this small. And I'm getting a little bit older, and my wife keeps telling me that I need to go to the eye doctor once a year, but who has time for that? So, <laughs> so verse 13 As it is written, Jacob I have loved... I may have written down the wrong verse there. Okay, the point that was... The point was, in whatever verse I used, Paul was able to, to, Paul was able to convert people and to be successful in his mission because he loved people. He was able to humble himself... He was able to proceed into his work because in a lot of ways he he gave everything else behind. What was Paul's occupation? He was a tent maker. He was the tent making preacher, right? But he went from town to town. He did work as he he went. But his job was to evangelize was to go and spread the gospel. There's a quote there at the top of the lesson. Um, Elton Trueblood was who was credited with it in, in our booklet that we have. But it says, Evangelism is not a professional job for a few untrained men, but it is instead an unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. Whose job is it to evangelize? Every Christian. Okay? It is not just the job of the preachers. Now, Paul was willing to do the work. It was hard. Here's a hard truth. It is a lot easier to write a check and pay somebody else to do hard work than it is to do it ourselves, correct? And whether you're landscaping the yard or you're digging ditches or you're, you're evangelizing, all of that, it's a lot easier. If it's really hard and you can afford it, it's a lot easier just to write a check and have somebody else do it. Is it more rewarding to do that? Is it more reward, is there not a degree of satisfaction in seeing a job well done? I think something that we miss with evangelism is we think that it ends 
the moment someone obeys the boss or obeys the the scriptures. We say they've obeyed the scriptures, and then we walk away. And an opportunity for all of us, and I would I would say probably the brotherhood in general, is figuring that out on after someone obeys the gospel, what's our steps for training them correctly? Because that's not what we read in the scriptures. We don't see that they stopped teaching people after they'd obeyed, obeyed the gospel. We can continue to develop, to develop that foundation, continue to get people involved. Paul, would, back to Doug's point, Paul was adaptable. Let's circle back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19, or 19 through 27. Let's look back there. So, Paul being adaptable. So let's look at this. To the Jews, I was a Jew. That I might win those who are under the law. I have this theory that Paul was a closet sports fan. Because if you look at how many times that he talks about, I'm going to fight, and, and even in this, in this scripture that we're looking at, I'm going to fight not as someone who is beating the air. Okay? And he talks about, I have fought the good fight. Okay? He talks about running the race and how you're supposed to run the race. His goal here, when I went to the Jews, I went that I may win them. And he says them, that about the, the Gentiles as well. He got, talks about those who are weak. Do, go ahead, Clyde. He went to the Jews because he thought that was an easy out until the Lord caught him on the road to Damascus mm -hmm. and changed his mind. So those are the ones he was, he was familiar with. We're not, not going to get floored like he was. Correct. We need to see it because we did it. That's correct. Now, his mindset, though, when he went to these groups, he went to win. I've had the opportunity for the past few years to coach my girls. You know, they're four and seven. And we, playing softball, and they're getting involved in sports. And a comment that I make is, we're going to try to win every game. We're going to learn a lot. We're going to have fun. But if we're going to do something, we're going to try to win. I wake up every morning, and I go to my job, and I want to win. If I don't think I'm going to win, if I'm in a position where I can't win, well, now we either got to change positions or, or we got to do something different. When we go into evangelism, when we go into trying to serve under others, let's put ourselves in a position to win. Let's think about this and, like, how am I going to be successful in doing this? If I don't think I'm going to be successful in doing it, Maybe, maybe we need to think about a different way to do it. Now, there are times when I would say if something's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Even if we can't be perfect at it, we don't need to wait for the perfect moment to be available for us to go and try to evangelize or to do anything. Because the perfect moment never comes, right? If you wait for everything to be perfect, that time's never going to be there. Sometimes we need, need to do things just for the practice and for the experience. But Paul went in, he went to the Jews, and he went to the Gentiles, and he said, I'm going to win. So let's look over at Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 22. Hopefully I got the verses right this time. I want to look at some of the language that, he, that was used here. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 22. Now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then 
certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and said, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a, proclaiming, a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, Areopagus saying, May we know what the new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Let's stop right there. So Paul's in Athens and he's waiting. And he hears and sees what people are teaching. And where does he go first, it says? Where does he first go? He goes to the synagogue. And then it says, then he goes to the Gentiles. What does, he say, what does it say that he does with them? What word does it use? He reasoned with them. If we are going to have a conversation regarding the scriptures with someone, what mindset should we take? Should we go to it? Or should we go and say, what are these people doing? What are you doing? You're wrong. And go with the mindset of being very aggressive? When I see the word reason, I think he went with a very, very logical mindset. And he said, hey, let, let me show you. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk about these idols. What does this lead to? What does this, this story lead to? He gets to walking around and what does he see? The statue to the unknown God. And he says, he says right here in verse 22, And then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the ob objects of your worship, I even found an altar with, to the, with the, this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you are worshiping without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who since made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples with hands, nor is he worshiping with men's hands as though he needed everything, since he gives all to life, breath, and all things. And he has made, made from one blood every nation of men, to dwell on all the face of the earth and to determine their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So he goes and he reasons with these people. And he says, you are very religious. It is obvious to me that you are trying to do the right thing. You just need a little direction. Back to what we said earlier. Do we know people who are very religious who are worshiping in error? Do they know that they are worshiping in error? Would they worship correctly if they knew the difference? What does Matthew 7, 21 through 23 tell us? Anybody remember that story right offhand? Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? Cast out demons? And what does Christ say? Apart from me, you workers of iniquity. It tells us that it's not enough just to be religious. Those men didn't know what they were doing. These men didn't know what they were doing. They were worshiping. They wanted to do the right thing. But nobody had taught them. Let's look back at... I need to mark this. Real quick, so I'm because I'm keeping them. There we go. If we look in chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. What is Paul saying there? He was adapting to his audience. He admits that he was still associating with the weak. To those who were weak, he was going not as one who was weak, 
but he was okay meeting them on their terms. Maybe he had a different expectation for them than, say, he did for the other apostles. Now, I think that that's probably true because if you think about in Galatians, we'll talk about that. I've got it further in my notes. What does Paul say to Peter? Does Paul not call out Peter for, for not going to the Gentiles and not teaching them? I think Paul had higher expectations for members of the church than he does those who, who are weak, those who had more education. In Romans chapter 15, we read a little bit about this. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. When we who are strong, or we then who are strong, ought to bear with, bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. What does the word edification mean? Excuse me? Building up, correct. So we who are strong should help those who are weak, leading to education with the hope to build them up. Three missions of the church. We mentioned them last Sunday, Victor, I believe, in our, our study. What, what are the three missions of the church? Evangelism, benevolence, and edification. Three things there that the church is... So we're, we're to spread the gospel, build up our members, we're to help those who need help. Paul says here, we who are strong ought to bear with, scruples, bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So we're not doing it just to build up our own selves. We're to build, do it with the hope that it builds up others. Now, let's talk. We've got... Six, seven minutes here. Let's talk about our application. Okay. Christian, Christians, Christians should be governed by our mission. What is our mission? Seek and save those who are lost. By that, by that logic, should what we do as the church, should everything we do not be governed by, is this action helping us seek and save those who are lost? Okay? So every time we do something, this is, this is our arrow. Okay, this is helping us seek and save those who are lost. I would argue that that includes not only those outside the church building, but also, or not only those outside the church, but those inside the church. A soul that is inside the church, keeping that person from being lost is just as important as those who are outside that we're trying to save. Verse, Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And, they sh and how shall they believe in whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Someone has to hear the word of God before they can believe it. And for them to hear it, someone has to go and teach, teach it to them. You cannot hear something that is not being said. How many, times, how many times do we try to hear something that's not being said? Okay. Try, you know, we think that we're reading between the lines. You know, somebody, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're going to say. No, you don't. <laughs> Christians have a reason for their mission today. We must be diligent. We must, must persevere. And we must take advantage of opportunities. There are people... How, how many times do you know someone who I'm going to say gets lucky a lot. Okay, say it's in business or it's in sports or, uh, you know, I'm a big deer and turkey hunter and, and you see people like, man, they, they get lucky a lot. Well, here's the thing. 
Those people who get lucky a lot, you heard about somebody that's an overnight success and they're 15 years in the making? Like anything else, you have to be in the situation where you are looking for opportunity and you have to be prepared to take advantage of that opportunity when it comes. You cannot wait for opportunity to present itself with anything and then say, okay, I have to go and prepare for this opportunity that is here. Because by the time you get prepared, what's happened? It's lost. It's gone. Those who are lucky put themselves in situations where opportunity is available and are prepared to take advantage of it. Our drive for success determines our actions. Okay? Some of you, some of you know this, and, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, towards the end of it, Paul talks about running a race. He talks about fighting not as one beating the air, so he's not shadow boxing and being prepared. Uh, my wife and I are flirting with the idea of running a half marathon. She's, she's probably going to do it. I'm, I feel like I'm still flirting with the idea. Um, I, she talked me into starting to run a few uh, 12, 16 months ago, something of that nature. I had other motivating factors at that time. But uh, uh, I, was, I was going on a big hunt in Colorado, and I didn't want to die in the mountains out there. So I, what, 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 so I had to lose some weight. So, um, but, you know, you start thinking about running, running a marathon or something of that nature. You know what your first step is? Get, well, the first step is getting off the couch, Clyde. <laughs> you can't, if you're going to do that kind of stuff, you can't sit around at night and uh, drink milk and eat little Debbie cakes. Uh, you've got to get off the couch is the first thing. Well, a, a lot of us are still sitting on the couch. I feel like maybe we're not on the couch, but we're not that far out the door. And maybe we're not running a marathon, but some, we need to be prepared for that opportunity to come along. Yes. <laughs> oh. Christians today can't achieve their mission. I wish Brian was in here. He had a lesson a few weeks ago talking about Christ and John the Baptist. What was the quote? I must decrease. Yes, I must increase, or I must decrease, or he must increase, but I must decrease. Okay? Got to be prepared. But in, others for, in, in order for us to be prepared, in order for us to teach others, maybe we need to humble ourselves in order to lift others up. We must become a servant to win others. Not to prove what was right. Not to prove that they're, we're right. We must learn and learn to adapt without compromising ourselves. It is a fine line if we are going to others and we are going to teach on meeting them where they are without compromising ourselves. If we're going to go to somebody, we, ha they, we have to realize that we don't necessarily condone what they are doing, but we are willing to teach them a better way. Any questions? Any comments? Say. Exactly. It's a percentage game, right? So what Doug was saying is in verse 22, he says, I do all these things that I may save some. He doesn't say that I may save all. If you look at the numbers through sales, through evangelism, it becomes a numbers game. I'm going to do this many calls. I'm going to get this many return calls. I'm going to convert this many people. The bigger your front end number, the, the bigger your back end number. 
Now the hope is that you would be able to develop your process to become more efficient, to have less waste, and that would lead to your back end being bigger. Now, I will say from the evangelism side, you need to call them fertile ground. You know, work with fertile ground. Your low-hanging fruit that we see, they're the ones that you have the best chance of having success with. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm selling, it's really dry right now. Some of y'all have been blessed with quite a bit of rain in the past couple of days. I've got three-eighths of an inch of rain, I think, in, in the last 30 days at my house. So we've, some of you, we talk about gardens every week. If I'm a sprinkler salesman right now, it'd be pretty easy to go and see which yards I'm going to call on. Right? If somebody's got a really green grass, yeah, they probably don't need my services. If somebody's got brand new grass and it's, it's looking uh, about the color of these church pews right here, that's probably somebody we need to talk on. Talk to the fertile ground. What does that mean for us? Those who have lost loved ones, those who are sick, things of that nature, look at our fertile ground. I appreciate everyone's attendance this morning and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you. Thank you very much.